Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar uh, called Ready, Test, Go. We're going to be talking about driving account-based marketing results using machine learning. And we're thrilled today to have our guest uh, and customer, Sapulti, to talk about some of the exciting things they're doing. Uh, so before we get started, we move to some housekeeping items. So the first thing is uh, how to ask questions. So uh, you'll see on the left of your screen that there is a chat box. Um, feel free to ask questions at any point throughout the presentation. We're going to hold until the very end to do a dedicated Q&A. Um, but you know, feel free to ask questions uh, as they come to you, and, and we'll get to them as, as they come, through, come in uh, during the dedicated Q&A section. Um, additionally, we're going to be recording this webinar, so uh, we'll send out that link usually within about 24 hours uh, of the conclusion of the webinar. Um, so if uh, you have friends or colleagues who couldn't make it, uh, you'll receive that by email and can forward the recording link along. Also, after the webinar, we'll uh, be continuing the conversation on Twitter. So uh, we've got post metadata and Spalty's Twitter handles on there as well as our two speakers. Um, so uh, feel free to ask questions on Twitter or use the hashtag B2B ABM and we'll uh, keep our up with you. Um, so like I said, today's webinar is uh, ready, test, go. Uh, so our first speaker will be Gil Alush, the founder of Metadata.io, uh, followed by Shannon Sam, uh, who runs command gen over at Sepulti. Um, so at this point, I will turn things over to Gil to get us started. Wonderful. Thank you, Nate, and welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. Um, I'm very excited to present to you uh, a little bit of the new paradigm shift in the market using artificial intelligence for account-based marketing. And then um, we'll go through into some particular examples of how exactly uh, to apply that into your day-to-day -day activities. So let's start in the beginning um, and talk a little bit about account this marketing and kind of the problem that we're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. Today in B2B, um, there is really no excuse to not having a scientific uh, approach to demand generation. But the reality is that that's not the case today. It's becoming increasingly difficult to operate your stack. You may have dozens of different tools that you have to operate between your marketing automation, your retargeting tool, your advertising tool, your data sources, so on and so forth you end up spending the vast majority of your time in technical mundane tasks like, you know, UTN tasks, um, enriching data, buying lists, doing A-B testing, setting up campaign manually, um, so on and so forth. And that leads to a situation in which you don't really, you can't really predict your, your outcome. You can't really say, okay, my quarter this, this year, my, you know, my next quarter is I need to generate $10 million in revenue in, in pipeline for my sales counterpart. Therefore, I need to generate you know, 106 meetings, and that means I have to generate 517 MQLs, which leads me to 2,000 you know, um, leads, and that will cost me roughly $200,000. You can't really say that because usually you don't have those ratios. You don't have that scientific approach that can really lead you to, those, uh, predictability, to that predictability. And so that's what we're trying to solve with the company's marketing, um, particularly with the company's targeting, getting you leads, inbound leads that are qualified because they come from your um, target account and come to you at the right time because they decided to click on an ad um, and, and raise their hand and, and ask to be connected. And so that's what we built here at, at Metadata. We built a technology that essentially connects your existing stack, your marketing automation, your LinkedIn, your Facebook, we're connected to all the major data sources in our back end. We're connected to the demographic and firmographic ones, like Zoom Info and Inside View. We're connected to the techno technology install base ones, like AG Data and Data Nice, built with, et cetera. We're connected to um, the buyer intent ones, like Bombor and Litsift, um, you know, the IP to company reverse uh, lookup, uh, cookie data. And so you don't have to manually buy those uh, lists, at least for advertising purposes. If you still want to use them for sales, then you should. Um, and the idea is that the AI operator, in, imagine a virtual employee, just like you have a bot for scheduling, scheduling your, your appointments, just like you have a bot for um, you know, a chat bot on your website that can reply to people. 
Imagine that the same way you now have a virtual employee that runs campaigns on your behalf and, and handles all those technical tasks um, that you had to do manually before. And so more than just saving you dozens of hours a week, the big benefit is that it's an automated process. All the data fly, flows through from one end to another, which means that you get predictability. You can actually optimize the process because if the process is connected and automated, you can start optimizing it. You can start reaping the rewards of automation and, and optimization. And with that comes predictability. So let's see how it works. This is the blueprint for metadata. That really explains to you how the system works from start to finish. And it starts by pulling data from your CRM system. We essentially start by, you connect your Salesforce or a different CRM, and the system will start ingesting all the opportunities that you have in your CRM and the objects associated with it. So the contacts and accounts associated with your opportunities. Next, it will rank them. It will rank the opportunities based on attributes like um, total amount, the time it took to close, the status of that opportunity, things like that. So a million dollar opportunity that will close one within three months is gonna be ranked higher than a $50,000 opportunity that took a year to lose. But nevertheless, we take all of those into consideration and then it will enrich all of the signals. So even if all you have is just the email and the job title and the company name that you sold to, what Metadata will do is will go and grab the rest of the details from third party data vendors. It will get the technologies that company is using. It will get the industries they're from. It will get the categories um, that uh, of, of, uh, of buying that they're currently in a, in a sales cycle for. They'll get their location and you know their size. The same thing will, do, will be done for the personas. It will identify how many people that you have to touch in order to close a deal. And to start looking at those people in terms of what is their job title, their seniority, the groups they belong to, their professional skills, their education, their age, their gender, um, you know, any, anything that might be relevant to their um, B2B signals or buying cycle. And then it will run a few different algorithms, uh, you know, some statistical functions like k-means, a modified k-means algorithm, as well as a machine learning predictive model to essentially identify what attributes correlate the most with what you're trying to optimize for. And you can choose whether you want to optimize towards um, close one only, whether you want to optimize towards any opportunity, whether you want to optimize for time to close, whether you want to optimize for the amount. You can say, hey, I care about the amount more than I care about the time. So you give it 70% for the, for the amount, 30% for the, for the time. And so that's how the machine learning will work and will start telling you, okay, here is your ICP. Here's your ideal customer profile. We've analyzed your historical data, we enriched it, we analyzed it, and we told, we, we found out that companies using these three technologies and come from these two industries and this company side from this location will lead you to the largest deals out there. And that's how the system will then turn and generate lookalikes of that ideal customer profile. Essentially build a new model of uh, accounts and prospects within those accounts mm -hmm. who are perfectly fit to that particular um, profile. And that's essentially the idea in, in those, um, those lookalikes. And so you start by having those um, lookalikes, but you can actually supplement them with as many uh, audiences as you'd like. You can, for example, say, I want to generate um, a list of companies using my competing technology, or I want to generate a list of companies using that are currently in the buying cycle for my kind of category, or I want to generate a list of companies who are currently uh, look like of my top five percentile deals. So you can slice and dice and create as many audiences as you choose, as long as they represent your precise target market. So at this point, uh, after the insight piece, you now have uh, your audience. So all the companies that you should, sell, you should sell to and all the people within those companies that you should sell to. And so the next thing that you have to do is engage with them. In order to accomplish that, what metadata will do is it will create an enriched subset of your target total addressable market. So it will go through all the companies and all the prospects that you have. Now you have all their details, but what metadata will do is it will get all of their PII, all of their personally identifiable information. So it will get things like their email address, their cookie, their mobile device ID, their IP address, it will get their social handles. And the reason to get all of those um, keys 
is for the purpose of running ads and, and essentially engaging with them via paid media. And so the moment we metadata will collect those details, it will actually automatically upload those to Facebook, to LinkedIn, to a programmatic DSP, which is essentially a way to advertise to any, um, on any channel, on any website, um, and kind of follow them with the ads. It's kind of like retargeting, but without the read, they don't actually have to visit your website for you to start advertising exactly where they are. And to Twitter and to a few other channels today, like Quora, uh, we're under beta, Pinterest, um, Instagram, etc. And now you have all of your audiences in very, very many different segments waiting for you to be advertised. But the advertising isn't happening until you actually set up a campaign. And that's where the power of metadata comes into place because what the system will do is use multi-vite experimentation to actually start running campaigns and set them up and optimize them on your behalf. And instead of just setting up campaigns and optimize them on the usual metrics like impressions and clicks, here, metadata will actually optimize them based on the metric that you care about the most and your choice of penetration into named accounts, pipeline impact, or cost per lead. And so what metadata will do is essentially generate many, many different experiments. It could be dozens of experiments per month to thousands of experiments per month. Um, and essentially, it will try every collateral that you have with every creative that you have for those collaterals, with every segment of the audience that you have defined before, on any channel that you're enabled with any campaign type. And then essentially circulate through those um, variables until it finds the best combination that yields the best results for you. So the way it works is, let's say you have five collaterals, you have three eBooks and two white papers, and you're advertising on LinkedIn and Twitter. So, so far you have 10 different experiments. But now you're also not only doing display, you're also doing lead gen forms on, on Facebook and Twitter. So now you have 20 different experiments. And let's say you have two different creatives for every collateral. Now you have uh, 40 different um, experiments. And, and so, oh, sorry, you have 80 different experiments. So now the list goes on and on until you essentially reach your maximum number of experiments. And that will be uh, lowered by the budget. So if you have an unlimited budget, you can actually run all the experiments. But if you have a limited budget like all of us, then you'll probably lower your number of experiments to essentially make sure you don't achieve diminishing returns because you, you do need a, a minimum of $25, $30 per day per experiment. And so that's how the, the, the math would work. And so at that point, you have all of those campaigns kind of like a, a horse race running against each other. Most of them won't even uh, pan out to be paced. You won't even be able to spend that budget because it won't be able to find all the people in that channel right away. But many of them will start running. And the results of, the, of those results will start being recorded and measured. So every lead that will come through each and every one of those um, ads will get automatically enriched and pushed to your marketing automation. So just before we cover that, it's important to know, depending on the type of the campaign, if it's a display ad campaign that brings you to a landing page, it will bring you to the landing page automatically. We're, we're bringing that lead, so a person will click on an ad on Facebook, it will come to a landing page, if they don't, first of all, the form of that landing page can be significantly shortened because every lead is automatically enriched. And so you don't have to ask things like job title, company name, industry. Those are automatically fulfilled for you. You can ask questions that are not automatically fulfilled, like you know, your discovery questions, for example, or maybe replace some of your usual questions with your discovery questions. But once a lead comes through, if they don't sign up and they decide to click the X button, then an ad will keep following them, every, following them everywhere they go. If they do convert, the lead, as I mentioned, will be enriched, even if it's a personal email, because the person signed up to Facebook or LinkedIn with a personal email, still the link will be enriched, the lead will be enriched with all the information, even the corporate email address will be guessed and provided to the marketing automation, not for the purpose of sending email to the corporate email because they didn't sign up with that corporate email, but for lead scoring mechanism, just to make sure that you don't actually get um, you know, a bad lead score. And so uh, you will get all that information, all the, all the lead information, as well as, as information about how that lead came into, I mean, to, came into place, like what channel did it come from, what campaign type, what creative did it click on, um, the, the segment of the audience, the, the, the collateral, so on and so forth, and to push all of that and map nicely to your marketing automation, like a Marketo or HubSpot or Eloqua. And then it will move that... Uh, lead through your, your nurture guide. So whatever your, your nurturing path is happening, 
it will start nurturing that lead. And based on the lead score and the and essentially the the behavior of that lead, that's where the learning starts happening. Because metadata is connected to your marketing automation, it can see what score that lead got. It can see if that lead belongs to one of your named accounts. It can notice if that lead has a match to your ICP. And so based on those attributes, and of course your Salesforce, it can it can find out what your Salesforce every week it will pull data and it will see whether that lead made an impact on your pipeline. Did it create a new opportunity or did it impact an existing opportunity? And it will take all of those attributes that we just mentioned, the lead score, named account, pipeline impact, and ICP match, and it will rank the experiment accordingly. If your experiment you know, yielded 10 leads and at a good price, and those leads are now, one of them generated an opportunity, that experiment will now get a high score and will get more budget accordingly. And even more new derivatives of that campaign will be created, new smaller experiments that try to further optimize that particular experiment. And of course, the rest of the experiments that are yielding either natural, neutral, or negative results will be eliminated. And usually the 20-80 rule applies. 20% of the experiments yield 80% of the pipeline. 80% is being eliminated. 20% are creating new, exp new experiments based on the 20%. All the budgets move there. And then the learning mechanism keeps on going. So it's a, a fully um, kind of automated process where it's learning from, from results. So you start by learning from historical data, and then you move into learning from um, real-time performance data. So just to give you some idea of how the system looks like, you know, the, the view is the view of a CMO. At the end of the day, you care about your funnel. And because we're connected to your marketing automation yourself, first, we can report your funnel. We can say how many impressions lead to how many clicks, lead to how many leads, lead to how many MQLs, how many SQLs and meetings come out of it, and what's the opportunity value of the total um, opportunities created. You can also, also see how many people you're targeting, how many campaigns are actually active right now? What's the budget you spent so far? What's your cost per MQL and cost per opportunity? And so you can measure all those things and go to your uh, CRO, your CEO, your CMO, and report very accurate numbers and bring them predictability. You can tell them, listen, if you want to achieve $10 million in pipeline next year, these are our numbers. This is the budget I need in order to generate it. You can give me a quarter of it, and I'll be able to generate a quarter of that pipeline. And so... That's a very um, important thing in terms of analytics. Another important factor is when you do programmatic advertising, as I mentioned before, programmatic advertising is the ability to run retargeting without the re, essentially be able to show an ad to the right person at the right time, wherever they are, whether they're watching a video on YouTube or they're watching a game on ESPN or reading the news on NBC, they'll be able to see your ads wherever they go. The price of that ad is usually more expensive, but the advantage is that you can get a very accurate log data on who is seeing the ad and where. Meaning, even if those people never clicked on your ad and never came to your website, we can still show you what websites they come from. And we can show you how many times they've seen your ads. And we can show you what website they've seen your ads on and what was the referral. Um, if they clicked, we can tell that they clicked. If they converted, of course, we can tell they converted. We can give you the company names that have seen your ads and how many times they've seen it. So you really get this kind of when you get a lot of account-based um, types of analytics, and you can break it down and customize your view and say, I want to break it down to my East Coast, my West Coast, and maybe my APJ uh, territories, and you have that capability. Then we have the search engine. So as I mentioned before, we aggregate data from all the major B2B data sources out there. In order to make it work, we created a machine learning classifier that knows how to translate uh, all the different data taxonomies from one data source to another. So an industry on LinkedIn is different than an industry on InsideView, which is different than an industry on Edge Data. So how do you make the differentiation? We have that machine learning classifier that knows how to translate between one to another. And so that gives us the ability to search and create Venn diagrams and subsets across all of those categories of data. You can say, I'm looking for companies who are currently using my competing technology and are in the market for my category in the last six months and are within my ideal customer profile. And that particular subset will be the subset that you create. And then in this screen, you can see how you can create those types of uh, audiences. And unlike a regular audience like on, on Facebook or LinkedIn where they just tell you, hey, you have 700,000 people here and that you're targeting, here you actually can preview the people. You can see their emails, but you can see their job title, the company they come from. You can see all the rest of the details 
uh, about those those audiences so you can decide whether they're a good audience for you or you want to refresh it and create it with a different criteria. And then finally, you have the experiment view. This is where the AI operator lives and breathes. Uh, well, I guess it's not breathing, but it definitely lives there. And so it tells you what exact operation it's been doing, what experiments it is performing and optimizing, what experiments it, it ended, um, what experiments are active and succeeding, how they are being ranked, and why. And you get the data. You can always decide or do you want to run things on autopilot and just let the, uh, the AI make decisions on, on, on its own, or you want to get informed and approved or reject their uh, suggestions. So just to kind of rehash it again, you start from the insight, go through the enrichment process and analysis, it profiles your ideal customer, and then it generates your total addressable market with all the PII. Once you have that audience, it takes that audience and moves it all the way to the social networks and the programmatic networks in order to do run ads. And then it runs multivariate experimentation, hundreds of experiments, as, much, as many as you'd like, and start limiting and, and narrowing down to the experiments that yield the most um, results for you. And then, of course, you get that ongoing learning methodology. So that is our process, and that's how uh, we think Demand generation for B2B companies is being done scientifically and how you can guarantee optimization over time. And so without further ado, I'll move it to Shannon, who works at Hippalti and can take you through her story, how she used AI and ABM in order to achieve her results. Take it away, John. Great. Thank you, Gil. Um, really happy to, to be here sharing our story today. And um, we'll kind of dive into our reasons, um, and you'll hear back uh, things that Gil has just explained about the technology, and I'll kind of walk through um, how we're using those things to kind of tie programs into our ABM strategy, and also leveraging this technology to open up a new lead channel for us as well. So I'll just start with who is Tapalti. As um, Gil mentioned, I head up DemandGen at Tapalti. We're a um, fast-growing startup with a payables automation solution that frees finance executives to be more strategic. And what that means is that we offer a um, solution for managing um, accounts payable the way that most companies have to pay bills, and we help automate that process. And also, um, for companies pay hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands um, of freelancers, publishers, advertisers, we streamline that, that process and automate that process for them so that their finance teams can really focus on some other things in the company instead of paying all the bills. Um, our customers are using our platform to remit over $4 billion in annual uh, payments to over 1.8 million suppliers and partners. And just as I kind of described a bit about what we do, you can imagine that we are always looking to target some very specific industries. Um, we've developed a very um, uh, specific target account list that we are going after, so that all definitely impacts our marketing strategy and gives us some unique challenges or actually maybe not totally unique challenges. I think as marketers, we all, we all face a lot of common challenges. So um, just to kind of dive into those challenges a little bit, you'll see this, mm -hmm. this image here of a car coming off a cliff. Now, <laughs> this is from one of my favorite TV shows, The Grand Tour, which I, uh, when new episodes are out, grab a cup of coffee on Saturday morning and watch this. It, if you don't know already, um, it was previously called um, Top Gear, and they've kind of redone the show. And um, there's three hosts that are gearheads and do these different challenges with cars. And in this particular episode, they each um, were challenged with driving a car down a runway in Denver. Um, this is a very high runway uh, with a very abrupt ending. And um, the goal was to go 100 miles an hour and then stop the car before you got to the end of the runway. And you can see somebody didn't make it. I'm, I'm sure through some clever editing, the driver's just fine. But th this image is appropriate um, for some of my challenges because about eight or nine months ago when I was um, you know, evaluating 
our marketing mix and our programs and realizing the, the growth and, and the goal the company had to, to grow sales and obviously as most companies to grow their business, um, I started feeling really uh, at some point down the line that we were going to be constrained with the channels that we had. We were working really hard to optimize them and sometimes you just you max out um, what you get from you know webinars and events and all the different things that we do in marketing. So I was really thinking about new ways to kind of expand that mix and generate a new channel for leads. At the same time, we were already trying to um, paid social advertising internally. We were not doing very well at it, <laughs> to be honest. Um, it was a little bit of a struggle to kind of balance quantity and quality. Um, we all, you know, the marketing team got together and kind of exhausted our knowledge on the topic pretty quickly. We reached out to consultants um, who, you know, had great advice, but um, I was trying to have a more um, scalable approach to the to the problem we were facing. You know, like everyone, there's limited resources. Um, and so I, I was just trying to think of a way. I believed in this as a channel, um, especially with kind of ABM and going um, target, you know, having a target account-based mindset. Um, so I thought there was definitely some good opportunities there, and we just needed to figure out how to, to do that and make it possible and make it scalable. Um, like I already alluded to, we need to manage resources just like everyone else. So um, really also just wanted a technology-based solution that we could scale and, um, and grow and just continue to manage. And of course, um, integrating with our overall ABM strategy, um, I definitely don't like to bring new programs into the mix that um, you can't be certain of the quality of leads you're gonna get, so really wanted to be focused on our specific verticals and um, generating leads from our target account list and in alignment with our ABM program. So as you can kind of hear these challenges, and like I said, they, they may not be very unique to me. Um, marketers face a lot of the same challenges, but um, thinking back on how Gil was describing the solution, um, it, you can start seeing how this is a fit. So I um, heard about metadata and learned more about their solution, and so we decided to um, go ahead and, and implement and um, start using the solution and piloting it and see how that would work for us. And this was about um, a month or two after we were really trying to look, away, look for a way to solve for this. And um, so I would say we started our program somewhere in the neighborhood of seven or eight months ago. Um, Getting started was really pretty easy. Um, as Gil discussed, you definitely have to build out your ideal customer profile. So uh, as you know, marketing in general, we had already done a lot of this work. We knew very specifically who we wanted to target and what companies, and, and there was a mix there. It wasn't all just a company. It's part our target list of company names and part our target in terms of um, specific verticals that we wanted to reach. So uh, that process went very quickly. Uh, we got that piece together and then moved on. Oh, and I'm going to get to what these numbers here are on the slide in just a second, in case you're wondering. Um, then we moved on to actually just setting up the program. So getting started with creative and content and just exactly um, the kind of pieces we were going to run. And of course, um, a really important piece is just establishing integrations and workflows. So we use um, Salesforce and Marketo. So really, um, if, if you've used those systems, you know you need to be careful and do some testing and make sure that the data you're bringing in comes in properly and gets distributed to the sales team properly as well. So we spend a little time making sure that that was all um, running smoothly. Okay, so the numbers. 
<laughs> um, once the program was running, we were um, testing, as Gil said, it's, it's built in to the technology. So there were a lot of tests running. 652 represents the total number of tests we've done so far um, with our programs. 265 of those through LinkedIn and 387 through Facebook. I can tell you right, right now that <laughs> there's no way um, internally that myself and the team would have been able to run all of these tests and get all of these learnings um, in the seven months or so that we've been doing this. So um, it's just nice to be able to leverage technology to, to learn about how your campaigns are performing. And also, for if you're running a program like this already or thinking about it, um, I think it's really important to establish the process beyond collecting leads. So obviously, it's great to um, bring a new lead into the system and say, you know, I've, I've got all these new leads and I'm meeting my goals. And there's always the next step, right? So we are very conscientious about um, pulling people into targeted nurture programs, um, having the SDRs follow up with them. So there's definitely a lot of follow up after we bring a lead in. And we're finding um, in general and through a lot of our programs, because we um, are bringing people in based on specific content offers, we can put them in specific DRIP programs that actually increases their engagement over time. So um, doing a program like this where we know what leads we're targeting and when they're coming in, we already know some information about them really helps us um, continue the conversation and make sure that we are delivering relevant information to them. Okay. So testing. Of all of those 652 tests, what, what have we learned? Um, the short story is there's, there's probably less surprises um, than uh, I expected going through the process, but just some general things I think that apply more broadly um, and have kind of proven out to be true for us, and, and we're always open to testing everything. I often um, am wrong about test results, so I'm, <laughs> I'm always curious to to just try something out and, and see if I'm proven wrong or right, um, and just keep an open mind and see what the results say. So for us with testing, um, mainly we're running programs through Facebook and LinkedIn. The two channels are obviously a little different um, just by nature of how they are set up. So for us, really on the ABM side, um, you know, LinkedIn is made for that. It's, it's really an account-based kind of platform. So there's definitely um, a lot of good success there with targeting specific companies. Um, and Facebook is a little different, but we definitely um, can really still generate some good leads from there and have some really good targeting capabilities from there as well. Um, okay, so offers by segment. This is something that I um, kind of just alluded to previously, which is just really um, having content that um, is aligned with the audience you're trying to get to. And I know as marketers, we've heard this ten too many times, but getting the right content to the right person at the right time, it's, it's true. The more um, ability you have to be able to do that, usually the better engagements you can get overall. So we, um, I have the luxury of having a lot of content available. It's not always the case, but because of our very specific verticals, we definitely have very specific language and um, use cases for those verticals, and we have content to support that. So it's just really validated here. Um, if we, the more that we can segment and the more finely tuned we are, the, the better the results are. Not really a surprise, but definitely um, something important to really help your results. Um, okay, landing pages versus lead gen forms. Again, not really a surprise. It's really um, nice in these platforms to have lead gen forms built in. So for anybody listening who has built out these campaigns before, you know it's an option to just let the user um, get your content. Their data is already in the 
system, so it's a very streamlined process for them to get content and get registered for that. Um, as marketers, we of course really always want to drive people to our site and our forms and have them do things our way, which it doesn't, it's not always the best way. So um, doing some testing there, we definitely have found that using lead gen forms is more effective. Um, and as Gil described earlier, there's definitely uh, data to support that, so we can kind of support the more streamlined process and still um, you know, bring data into our system that we feel confident about and that um, we can use, again, to go back and, and nurture folks. And I know you're all thinking, what about emojis? <laughs> so we are a, um, you know, we target finance executives. It's not, we don't use a lot of fluffy language or do a lot of really crazy outside the box things. Um, but when you're running campaigns on Facebook, um, it's a little different environment. So we, we went outside of our comfort zone, um, tried using emojis in our campaigns, and you know what, it's pretty successful. So, so we'll continue doing that. Um, that was actually one little surprise in all the testing that we did. And now the results. I hope you're all thinking of questions because I'm definitely happy to answer those in just a few minutes. Um, so here's, here's back to my, one of my favorite shows, The Grand Tour, and these hosts, they, they have their hands thrown up in the air. They look like they're happy about something. I'm not sure what it was, but um, it feels a bit how um, we've come just a really long way with the paid social advertising campaigns. Um, so it's just kind of nice to have found um, a channel, a scalable channel, um, where we're actually getting good quality leads and something I feel confident about that we can um, grow and keep using to support our demand gen programs. That's, that was really one of the big goals we set out um, to make sure we got to at the end of this. And, and then like I said, it's really been a relatively short amount of time um, to get this channel up and running. Um, and it's already generating <laughs> about 15% of the leads that we pass to sales, which is pretty significant. I have about, um, I'd say 14 lead sources overall that all our programs are run through. Uh, paid social is a new one that we introduced when we started doing these programs. So it, it literally was at zero before this. <laughs> um, like I said, even though we were doing these programs in-house, uh, there was uh, some struggles and a lot of things we needed to learn and we just weren't really having a lot of success. So uh, to go from 0% of leads that we were passing to sales to 15% is a pretty significant improvement for us. And then between last quarter and this quarter in terms of volume, it's gone up 4x. So again, it gives me kind of confidence that this is um, scalable and something that we can continue to grow and, and optimize and learn about over time. So with that, that's our story. It's kind of short and sweet. I, I'm definitely open to questions. And Nate, I'll hand it back over to you to take that up. Great. Thanks, Shannon. Um, so just a reminder to folks in the audience, um, on your left there is a chat box. Um, you can use that to submit your questions. Uh, yeah. Let's see the next slide here. All right. Um, so we'll get started with the first one here. Uh, looks like this is for both our speakers. Uh, why don't we start with Shannon? So the question is, um, with AI running the campaign, how do you make sure there isn't a mismatch between the message and the channel when doing experiments? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we, I, I think our approach, knowing really who we're targeting and um, very specifically associating content with different groups of our audience helps us do that. So Gil might have a more technical answer for it, but from our perspective, it's really just about knowing how to match our content and match our audiences, and then just reviewing um, kind of the, the results as, as those. Wonderful. Yeah, I can add on that. Um, I would say currently the way we do it is when you create an, a new asset, when you create, so there's an inventory, um, you know, kind of page on metadata. When you create a new 
and you and you ask it, it asks you for a few different details. It asks you for things like, um, you know, the the PDF of the asset, the landing page, the URL, the thank you page, and then associated creative and then associated audiences because you know a total cost of ownership um, white paper might be great for the this financial decision maker, but not might, might not be a good match for the technology decision maker. So that's how it's done today. It's not to correlate between them. In the future. Uh, once the once the, the 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 our platform has you know hundreds of thousands of data points, it will actually be able to identify those automatically. And so in in the future, will the system will be able to guess to pull those assets automatically and guess those um, those uh, uh, those matches or at least recommend them, so you don't have to do it. Uh, but that's how it's done today. And so once the correlation is done, the AI operator knows how to run those experiments without confusing. Between collateral, a creative a channel, campaign type, and an audience. Great, thanks, Gil. Um, so we got a couple questions here that are similar. So let me try and merge them. So Shannon, just for you. Um, so what hesitations did you have before starting the project, and uh, how specifically did you convince your team to invest in metadata? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'm, I am definitely open always to experimentation and trying new pilots. And as a marketing team, we are that way as well. Um, and having been through the experience of trying this on our own um, and realizing that we just didn't have the expertise uh, or really the bandwidth to kind of go as deep with this and, and do as much with this as we wanted to, it, was, it wasn't actually really hard to convince people to try it. Um, and then in terms of, obviously there's always, uh, you know, cost with programs as well. I think this was really easy to kind of just bring, in, bring into our marketing fold. It doesn't change, you know, your media spend. You still have to do those things, and we were still trying to do that anyway. So it's really, it's a pretty clear choice when you, you know, our Topalti's product offering is really based on streamlining and taking advantage of technology and being scalable. And I think as a marketing person, thinking that way too, it just makes it an easy choice to, um, you know, there's no harm in, in trying it out and taking those first steps. And then um, if you are kind of paying attention to programs like these along the way, you can definitely um, make them work and be successful. So I, I think that was just our approach overall. Great, thanks. Um, for the next question here, I think it's probably for Bill. Uh, so the question is, uh, with metadata, what kind of conversion rate risk is typical after applying the fine-tuned optimization? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, really, there is no, there is no limit. Um, the minimum improvement we've ever received was about 50% uh, lead to opportunity conversion rate with the highest one being like 6x. Six, six so it really depends how good you were before and how long you let the machine. There are a few things that impact those things, right? Uh, first one is how good is your your product, your content, you know, things that are not really, re you know, related to to uh, to the AI, but just by the, by, by the uh, nature of having good content, good, good products, et cetera, good creative, those variables will just perform, and you know, once it finds that perfect combination, uh, that campaign will perform very high. Um, and then the second one is how good do you is your data data entry skills in your company? Like, are you are you do you have a lead scoring mechanism in your marketing automation? Do you have uh, your SDRs putting the right lead source uh, when they when they close a deal or they when they open an opportunity? Do they have? Do they put the the right timing, and do they keep like, you know, if they if the if the opportunity is closed, do they report it properly? Those things will impact the machine learning because it relies on those signals. Uh, so either you do that properly, or at least you have a good relationship with metadata in which you can actually send them updates or request, you know, request some kind of uh, recalibration of the model based on results, even if they're not recorded. So those things really make make an impact and then can improve your um, your KPIs. The three things that usually customers see is one, lead to opportunity conversion rate goes uh, significantly higher over time. Um, second one is penetration to named accounts. You start seeing, you'll start noticing that 
you will not get any unqualified leads. Uh, vast majority of your leads will start coming from your named account. It won't happen overnight. Maybe you were maybe at 15% before using metadata. So when you start using metadata, maybe you're at 20%, then 30, 40, 50. We have some customers who achieve uh, 80% and higher. Uh, sometimes it took them six, seven, eight months to get there. But to this day, their second best channel is, you know, a third of that. And so that's a very big, uh, a big deal, especially for companies who are trying to really filter out all the bad leads and unqualified leads and really go towards companies that are in the ideal customer profile and in the company in the buying cycle. And then finally is the predictability, the predictability of your, of your funnel. That's, that's the third uh, big value proposition that um, that customers can get. Great, thanks, Gil. Um, got another question in here. So, when launching an ad campaign, how do you determine which channel is best used, and are some channels better suited for specific audiences? Um, it's probably for both of you. So, do you want to get started? Or Sure, yeah, it's a great question. And uh, I kind of touched on it earlier around being focused on Facebook and LinkedIn currently. And obviously, if you just think of as a user on those two channels, the kind of things that you're there for and um, just the, you know, your general use case there, you can imagine sort of um, targeting into those channels as well. So like I said, for LinkedIn, because we can be very, um, target account centric there, it's definitely a high performer in that area. Um, whereas with face, also on LinkedIn, um, they actually match very well with our sort of unique and very specific verticals and audience that we're going after. So there's a lot of strong performance there. Um, and then on Facebook, we, we can do a lot of the same things, but it's just, we convey sort of a different <laughs> vibe there, um, and it feels like a little bit more of a, you know, open campaign, a little bit more, you know, broad in the type of leads that we get from there. Um, so there's a little difference, but really um, both have great targeting capabilities overall. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, Gil, do you have any advice for uh, folks trying to determine their channel of choice? I would say, um, first of all, I think it's Shannon was, was, was very accurate there. I would say that it really depends on what kind of uh, personas you're going after. Uh, usually you slice and dice the, the channels by the investment you want to put. You like programmatic is by far the most expensive one, but it's the most accurate. It's like a needle in a haystack. You know, you can go after a very, very, very small audience. We're talking like, you know, like dozens of people, not even like 20, 25 people to, to go after. Um, so it really, you can really find those people um, and make sure that these are the people that you're going after, but it costs you a lot of money. Uh, but on the, again, on the other end, you get, a, you know, very, very wealthy analytics. You can see exactly where those people are, what websites, what times, what ge geography locations, when they see your ad, when they click on it, when they convert, so on and so forth. And then the, ch the lowest cost, I should say, is Facebook lead gen campaign. Facebook is a lower cost. Um, CPL channel, and by doing um, Legion, you remove, you know, most of the friction from the from the conversion. And so, literally, if someone sees an ad, they click on it, then they click download, and they see the PDF right away on Facebook, uh, uh, and they never have to go anywhere. They never have to fill any forms. It's automatic, and so that makes the the, the cost a little lot a lot, a lot cheaper. Now, I would say if you're going after it might be younger crowd or more common kind of uh, middle to lower level, like software engineers or, or mid -level, you know, middle level managers, um, or people who are in Facebook, like, you know, a, a lot. Uh, I don't know about Chan, but I'm on Facebook still, unfortunately, uh, quite often. And so you can convert uh, me on a lead gen form, and it would cost you, you know, uh, low cost versus if you're going after, you know, C, C level, C, CXO, or even a VP level at a Fortune 500, a Fortune 100, maybe you want to put them on. You definitely want to try to get them on Facebook, but it doesn't cost you any money to try to, to find them. It doesn't find them. It doesn't solve any impression. It doesn't cost you anything. But it's more likely you'll find them on programmatic and on LinkedIn, uh, and it will cost you more, but it's okay. And so that's how we would usually uh, divvy it up. 
great. Thanks, Gil. Uh, looks like another question for Shannon. So uh, how long did it take to start seeing uh, quality leads come in? Yep, it's a great question, and of course, what we're all always looking for. <laughs> so uh, really pretty quickly, um, we obviously were doing a lot of experimenting in the beginning, tested out um, you know, text and just all kinds of different ads and, and um, things, and pretty quickly started honing in on the ones that were working. I would say um, for the first roughly Three months, it was much more experimentation. We still brought in definitely some good leads, but it took us a little, you know, adjusting and learning to kind of really get things on track. So um, while we we went from generating almost no leads, <laughs> we were doing it ourselves and certainly not any of quality. Um, we immediately stepped into a place of generating leads and the quality, um, but it definitely took a little time to take that and then turn it into um, something that we felt a lot more confident about. So I'd say two to three months from, from the very beginning. Great. Uh, thanks. And then, um, Gil, do you want to add anything to that? I, I think it's fantastic uh, to ask that question and to set that expectation. You know, uh, sometimes it takes uh, less time that it takes more time, but the, the biggest thing when you are when you have a scientific approach to to solving a problem, um, and you believe in the process, you know we can guarantee that the audience you're going after is exactly the audience you want, and we can guarantee this is the, what we think is the most effective way of of, uh, of running digital demand generation. However, you do need to be comfortable with uh, experimentation because. We're not like a lead gen company, right? We don't sell you leads. We don't run a webinar like this for 5,000 people. We collect those leads and then we resell them to 50 different companies. That's kind of the guaranteed guarantee that people sometimes want. Um, here, we're kind of teaching you how to fish. And it's your machine, it's your brand, it's your account. You can anytime you can go, go into your account in Facebook and LinkedIn or, and other other advertising channels. You can see those audience. You can see the experiments. You can create new ones. It's essentially yours. Um, and so. In return, it, you know, it takes some time to, to get to that place because experimentation, just by the nature of it, you need to kind of do a trial, trial and error until you get um, to, to your kind of you know, promised land. So I, I think I like that question. It set expectations very well and very healthy transparency between a vendor and a, and a customer. Great, thanks. I think we've got time for one more question here. So. Uh... This is another one for Shannon. So how much time and bandwidth does metadata acquire for, uh, from your team? Uh, you know, a lot of marketing teams out there are, are pretty busy, so they're just, you know, what was your experience like? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I will say that uh, working with metadata, they make it really easy. So um, this is actually a program I've taken on and managed directly right now. Um, my team, you know, they use these channels maybe for from, for some very very small um, targeted events or something. But um, this is something I'm managing right now. It's it's really, um, you know, there's it's fun to kind of look at the results and what's happening with it and testing out new things and turning you know dial and really seeing the progress that the program is making. So I really like being involved with it and. Um, so it's, in terms of my team, it's not taking any of their time, and it's actually something that's quite um, manageable for me to manage right now. So. Thanks. All right. Um, Gil, do you have any uh, final thoughts here? We're almost out of time. No, no. I think I think that's uh, that's, that's very accurate and fair. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Excellent. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, Shannon. All right. Okay, well, folks, um, I think we're out of time now. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the webinar has been recorded, and so the uh, link to that player will be sent out by email uh, within the next day or so. Um, thanks again for joining us for the webinar, and thanks again to our speakers, uh, to Shannon for letting us know how uh, awesome our campaigns are running, and then uh, thanks to Gil for letting us know how metadata works. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Gil. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Sean. And thank you guys for attending today's webinar. Cheers.